Apple finally released new developer betas that make good on a promise that you probably forgot about, universal control. The feature was originally announced at WWDC last June, and it permits control between Macs and iPads with a single keyboard and mouse. But before all of the, well actually people, type their comments down below, yes, we know that Synergy and Mouse Without Borders and Barrier exist. Nobody is proclaiming that this feature is wholly novel. However, this is not your daddy's software KVM, and it brings some exciting new features that we really haven't seen yet. I've had the beta for a few days. I have played with it extensively, and I find it important that we discuss three things. Number one, the historical distinction between iPadOS and macOS. Number two, how universal control functions today and what you'll be able to do with it once it publicly releases. And three, what the feature means for the future of Apple's ecosystem. For many years, the iPad was perceived as a direct threat to the Mac. Though the device launched to fairly lukewarm critical reception, relegating it to the status of well, it's just a big iPhone, <laughs> the tablet rapidly picked up steam. And what a lot of Mac power users don't realize or are unwilling to admit is that the iPad outsells and has always outsold the Mac line, literally from year one of iPad sales. So naturally, given the tablet's success, Apple's iPad lineup, well, it's become more powerful and more capable and more diverse over time to match the Mac's melange of offerings. And through the iPad's renaissance, where Pro models were introduced with stylus support and the magic keyboard with trackpad was debuted. An iPad OS forked from the iPhone, bringing a bunch of exclusive features. And Apple ran ads saying things like, well, it's a computer. Freaking hate that ad. The Mac line was left severely neglected. We had several years without any pro desktop machines and a laptop line that was plagued with issues from faulty keyboards to thermal throttling and even worse. From the average Mac user's perspective, the iPad was just not powerful enough to replace their desktop workload and their desktop experience was getting worse because Apple didn't care. Many frustrated users just wished Apple would bring Mac OS to the iPad or allow the Mac to inherit a touchscreen to combine the two already. Of course, Neither of these things happened, and Apple stayed true to their insistence that the Mac and the iPad were not merging. But here's the thing, they did merge a little bit. In early 2019, Project Marzipan, that had been uh, rumored for well over a year, was released as Catalyst, which allowed iOS developers an easy way to bring their AppKit programs to the Mac. And though they instituted weird UX incongruencies that were foreign to Mac users like long pressing the mouse button and unconventional menu item placement, they did achieve their goal of bringing more software to Intel Macs, though not always the best software. And in the reverse direction, we saw the rollout of Sidecar, a feature still present today that allows you to turn your iPad into a secondary display for your Mac. And while the touchscreen's utility was limited to, uh, well, only allowing for keyboard modifiers and an on-screen touchboard for your little fingers, the Apple Pencil was permitted to darn near navigate the entire OS. Last, when the ARM transition was announced, Apple stated that Apple Silicon Macs would be able to run any iPad app because, well, the hardware architecture was the same, and these apps could be downloaded straight from the Mac App Store. This triggered wild conspiracy theories and monkey-brained pundits like myself. If Apple was going to allow apps designed for touch to run on the Mac without any optimization, surely, surely these new Macs must have touch input. And a bunch of, well, strange and seemingly touch-focused additions made their way to the wholly redesigned Mac OS Big Sur as well. Go back and watch my video on this. I think that A, it is aged remarkably well, even though we don't have touchscreen Macs, and B, it highlights that finger-focused features in Big Sur are now almost entirely gone from Mac OS Monterey. Now look, I'm not saying that Apple was on the brink of touchscreen Macs, although hot take, I actually think that they were, and that we'll find out about it in a, in a decade's time. However, what is certain is that in the last year and a half, Apple has really backed off the seeming need to bring iPadOS and macOS together, and proof of that is universal control. I'll theorize why in a bit, but first I just need to show you how it works, because it's really cool. Well, I'll show you that second, because first we need to talk about this video's sponsor, Roborock. 
Roborock makes some of the best robotic vacuum cleaners that you can buy, and I've been using the Roborock S7 at home for the last several months. It has the features that you've come to expect from Roborock, so the industry's best app with excellent mapping and route planning, incredibly good suction, and so much more. We run ours on a route every day at 11 a.m. while we're both at work. And not only does this entertain our cat, but it picks up the mountain of hair that he leaves around on the daily. And my biggest beef that I have with robot vacuums is that they have such a small little dust bin. And Roborock's new auto empty dock, well, it solves all of this in spades. It is what it sounds like, a charging dock for your robot with a big old vacuum inside. So every time your robot docks, it'll suck all of the crap right out of the robot's dustbin. Its large three liter dust bags can hold up to eight weeks of crap and they self seal when they're removed from the dock, which is pretty cool. It also has multi-stage filtration, which helps eliminate pollutants from getting into the air while emptying. And it even has little brushes to clean the charging contacts on the vacuum itself. In short, it is a game changer. I've gone from needing to empty my Roborox dustbin daily to going weeks without ever touching the vacuum even once. I honestly sometimes forget that it even exists because I just come home to a clean floor every single day and it's amazing. Get yours today at the link below. Okay, so your first question might be, well, how do I enable universal control? And the answer is, you don't, because <laughs> it's enabled by default. Um, so as long as handoff is working, then universal control is going to work just fine. To have handoff enabled, uh, well, it's enabled by default, just like universal control, but you need to be signed into the same iCloud account. You need to have Bluetooth turned on and Wi-Fi turned on on all the devices. As long as those conditions are met, you are good to go. There's no additional setup required. As far as keyboard and mouse, you can use anything you want. It can be the ones that came with your machine, or it can be a USB keyboard and mouse. Does not matter. As for compatibility by year, any Mac post 2015 is probably gonna work fine. As long as it's running Mac OS Monterey, you should be good to go. There are some models that don't make the cut, but it's pretty well supported for a pretty wide range of options. Your next question might be, okay, well, how does it know where my device is? And the answer is, well, it doesn't. <laughs> it uses deduction to try and figure it out. So for example, if you set up for the first time your big iPad on the right side of your MacBook Pro, and then you drag your cursor over, it's going to figure, ah, they're trying to leave the right side of the MacBook Pro, which means that the iPad's probably on this side. There's no special technology, no special chips, it just guesses. And it does a pretty good job, but if for whatever reason it guesses incorrectly, you can go into system preferences in the displays section on your Mac. And over here, you can actually see where the iPads are located, you can rearrange them, and you can adjust their height and positioning laterally and or vertically, which is pretty dang cool. So you can get the setup exactly how you want. They basically function as external monitors that just happen to not run the same operating system. So that is how to set it up. But once it's set up, what exactly can you do? Of course, at minimum, you can move your cursor from one side to the other, and you can move your keyboard uh, to whatever the active device is. So if I come over here to my uh, iPad, I can open TweetBot, I can compose a new tweet, hello Twitter, and sent. That works just great. And then conversely, I can take this keyboard and mouse and I can go over here onto my Mac and open Spotlight or I can go all the way over to here to the uh, iPad mini, open my settings and I'm good to go. So keyboard and mice and, and trackpads, they span any OS, doesn't matter, works great. But you can also do more than that. So for example, if I take this uh, keyboard once again and I go back over to my big iPad, I can actually adjust the volume and I can adjust my media. There is no media, but if there was, I could. Um, something that is not working reliably for me right now, but other users have reported successfully, is brightness. So you can push that up and down and that should adjust the brightness on the iPad as well, which is pretty cool. This is all basic KVM stuff, okay? Like, sure, the, there's not KVMs on the iPad, but this is nothing that other apps couldn't handle across other Macs or in between Windows systems. So let's talk about the stuff that's actually pretty dang cool. First of all, file transfers. Haha! <laughs> so if I go into here and go into the Files app, I can take this video file that I have on my Mac, I drag it over onto the iPad, and check it out. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? This is locally stored on the iPad. So this is, this just works great. It's basically um, kind of a secretive airdrop. Conversely, if there's a file on my iPad like this STL, which I need a third-party app to be able to view, I can just drag this onto the desktop on my Mac, 
and I can press the spacebar and check it out. Now I can see that file inside of Quick Look, which is pretty dang cool. You can see how seamlessly this stuff kind of passes back and forth. It's honestly kind of spooky, it works so well. This also extends into other applications. Third-party applications, to be sure, but to give you an example, we'll just use Safari. Um, okay, Coda Electric Car. This is a car that I just bought. I'll be doing a video soon, so, you know, definitely uh, watch that. If I take this link from Wikipedia and I drag it over to the iPad mini, I drag it across the Mac desktop onto the iPad mini, and that link now opens on the MacBook Pro. And I can do the same thing on the MacBook Pro. If I take this same link, and I drag it onto the Mac. Well, it's been a little spotty dragging to the Mac, but trust me, it will work. There we go, Coda Electric Car. Pretty darn cool. Like I mentioned, this does extend to certain third-party applications. So let's say I really like this image of the Coda. It's my favorite image I've ever had before. And I open TweetBot and well, I've got it on my iPad, so I don't wanna find the article on my Mac. I just drag my cursor over, I hold the photo and I drag it over and say, this is a Coda. Tweet sent, <laughs> isn't that cool? And I can go here onto the iPad and I can scroll up to the top of the Twitter and check it out. This is a Coda, the image that I just tweeted from my Mac from my iPad, <laughs> mind blown. So it's basically AirDrop, but without having to use the AirDrop interface. Now you might be thinking to yourself, okay, guy, this is all cool, but what's the actual use case for this crap? Well, I can think of a few. Uh, number one, and probably most importantly, it allows you to pay fewer subscriptions. Tweetbot is the perfect example. This is a paid app on both the Mac and the iPad and the purchases are not shared. Now I might be incentivized since I'm paying for both month to month to just pay for the iPad version and keep the iPad to the side of my Mac. It basically acts as an extended display and there you go, you can save money on software. Conversely, there are some apps that are just, you know, better on one platform or exclusive to a platform. Uh, for example, uh, Missive is my mail client. It's a mail client I really love, um, but it sucks on the Mac because on the Mac it is an Electron app. So I could have Missive running on the left side of my Mac and then I can open up my emails on the iPad as if it were a secondary display. That is indeed pretty cool. But things go even deeper than that because um, there's a lot of, for example, photo apps. Like uh, Affinity Photo is an application that I like, but I'm not very good at Affinity Photo and I don't want to learn how to use it on the Mac, but it's more intuitive on the iPad. So I can just open projects here and then when I'm done with them, I can just drag them over to the Mac and I've got the Affinity Photo project on my desktop, which is really cool. And I can see applications for this getting amazing if they're like strictly integrated. And I'll talk about that in a second. But there's a couple more examples I can think of, of why you would actually want to use this. There are certain control apps. So a lot of pro apps have like uh, companion apps that are available on uh, iOS. For example, Logic is an audio app. Apple makes, it's called Logic Remote and it runs on an iPad and normally you've always had to touch it, but now you could have it in universal control and engage those commands directly with your keyboard and mouse without ever having to reach for your iPad, which is pretty cool. It's like a stream deck, but mobile, but digital, but not, but shared with the map. So cool. And then last but certainly not least, do not forget that you don't need to use iPads. You can use universal control between two Macs. So my brother recently called me because he has a work computer and he has a home computer and he wanted to use a KVM to share the same keyboard and mouse. And I went out and ended up recommending Barrier to him, but it, it required installation. He had to get the app off of GitHub and you know, there's just stuff that people don't wanna really deal with. And this is now built natively into the OS. It works seamlessly so, so, so well. It also works ad hoc, which is pretty cool. Uh, you don't need to go through the internet. All you have to do is be in the same car and they can talk directly to each other. You don't even have to be attached to a uh, uh, modem or router, which is freaking awesome. And then last but certainly not least, we kind of get to the what are the things I wish were added to universal control. Uh, desires for future revisions. Uh, well, for one, because macOS and iOS often share the same binary, they're literally the same app, it would be cool if we could interface between the two. If I could drag my Photoshop project from the Mac onto the iPad, make a couple edits with my Apple Pencil and drag it right back without ever interrupting my workflow, that would be freaking amazing. Just drag the window as if they were the same OS, even though they're not the same OS. That's a big desire that I have. And then the second one, and this is one that seems silly, but it, it really is something I'd wanna do. Um, Universal Control right now requires at least one Mac in the picture, but I have a lot of scenarios where I would love to just use two iPads. You can't do that yet, and 
the hardware, there's nothing special about Mac hardware that makes this possible that the iPads couldn't do. So I would like for these two devices to be able to communicate with one another. And yeah, that's my wish list for universal control. So as you can see, universal control provides a pretty excellent experience. I have run into a number of smaller bugs, but this is also the first beta. So I remain confident that they will be worked out before a public release. Now, I made a pretty bold declaration earlier that I think that universal control is actually pretty telling to the future of these platforms, and I truly believe that. Sidecar? It hasn't been updated to support the Magic Keyboard and Trackpad, which were announced and released a long time ago. And while that may just be lethargy on Apple's part in not wanting to push resources to an older feature that is likely not very popular, I actually think that it's more telling than that. And it's likely that Apple doesn't want the iPad to feel like it can run macOS because the iPad, frankly, shouldn't run macOS. These platforms are distinct. They have their own sets of strengths and weaknesses and trying to forcibly combine them more than is natural seems ill-advised. At the end of the day, Apple makes money through hardware sales, and so they will happily sell you both a Mac and an iPad. And so while their code bases and their hardware are closer than ever before, the likelihood that they fully merge may as well be zero. Just give me Final Cut Pro 10 for the iPad and I'll be happy. <laughs> Let me know in the comments below what you think. Is Mac OS coming to the iPad? Is iPad in some form or touchscreens coming to the Mac? Thank you so much for watching. Uh, let me know if you're interested in seeing more on the future versions of Mac OS and iPad OS, but most importantly, and as always, like the video, I guess. And it gets stuck sometimes. Stay snazzy.